Yeah, you know, I was uh, just looking, I was listening to some of your podcasts and I didn't get to this one yet, but uh, I'm definitely going to listen to it today after this. Uh, but I would love to chat a little bit about it was just in the realm of kind of this bre breathing, breath breathing mm -hmm. as, as an endurance athlete and a coach. One question I've been seeing a lot more in the last year now is just people thinking about this. Whereas like when I first got in the sport, it was just like, I think the assumption was kind of well, you just breathe and that'll kind of take care of itself. And yeah. I mean, there was stuff in like Jack Daniels book and things like that about like uh, two to one and one to two, like being optimal for especially like kind of some more up-tempo type sessions and things like that. But outside of that, I just feel like it hasn't maybe been dove into as much as some people are, are hoping for in the, in the current, current state. So what's going on with the literature with breathing? Are we seeing some new stuff pop up that's interesting to you? Um, I would say some new stuff i wouldn't say there's an absolute avalanche of brand new information i think uh like books like breathe like from james nestor which i really enjoyed i thought that was really good obviously patrick McEwen's been doing some stuff on that for quite some time now a lot of his stuff is based on the russian method of buteco breathing and he's got some other stuff on that too it, it's kind of, I think, one of those trends, kind of like ketogenic diets and other things that, you know, they've been around for a long time. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, they just kind of get real popular. And anytime we see, at least in the fitness world, trends become super popular, like the pendulum tends to go all the way, like well past moderate into the other extreme. And then it gets hangs out there for a while and then probably will swing back to the other end. And I think the resurgence of nasal breathing is probably responsible for that. And I think overall learning to nasal breathe is super beneficial. Um, I like nasal breathing at rest. I think it's a little bit more efficient and that's probably how we were designed. However, when the pendulum so far to the right, you have people that are probably under breathing during maximal exercise. Right. So if you're going absolute max all out, which by definition is going to be a shorter uh, time, then I think you don't want to be limited by how much air you can get in and out. And if you're trying to nasal breathe at max exertion, like a VO2 max test, especially near the end, you're probably compromising your performance on that side. However, if you're constantly breathing through your mouth, especially during sleep and just hanging out at rest, there's probably some other things you should look at there too. So I think the answer is probably as we'll get into somewhere in, in between more kind of moderate, but that's, that's never a real popular answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really sure. context. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I was told once was that like nasal breathing is a good gauge of whether you're like below your aerobic threshold. Mm -hmm. And so when folks are kind of learning to dial in to their perceived effort, which you know, I, I obviously I love as a, as a guide and a metric, but it, when you're working with someone new, it may be something that they have to kind of fine tune a bit before they really get it figured out versus, you know, someone who's been training for endurance sport and you can basically give them an intensity and they can pretty much get within the ballpark of where they're, they're targeting just by how they feel. Uh, but that nasal, the nasal breathing up to aerobic threshold, I found is an interesting, maybe teaching tool if possible. Is there any validity to that as being a, an accurate guide on average, or is that something that was just kind of bastardized over the years as well? Yeah, there might be, but I can't find an exact study on it. I know uh, Brian McKenzie has talked a little bit about it, and I think some of the stuff he helped with is still unpublished yet. Um, but I think in practice, it's probably a pretty good rough guide. The, the caveat with that, I would say, is that it's going to take some practice to do nasal in and nasal out so how i got into it was and almost probably four years ago now i was working with more crossfit athletes and i still work with a few now and the people i was getting were people who just you know love to redline themselves every day and so we would start doing stuff like heart rate variability do some heart rate during exercise and usually when i started working with them it was because they were you know overtrained or overreached their performance had stalled they couldn't figure out what was going on their metcons weren't getting better and we looked at their training their hrv and markers were like yeah you probably have overdone it a little bit but trying to get them to do you know moderate zone two zone three type aerobic development or easy work yee, that wasn't so easy because they didn't feel like they did anything 
So I tried putting heart rate straps on them. Like, okay, here's your max heart rate. You know, like the Phil Moffatone, 180 minus your age. This is your new upper rate limit. I don't want you to go above this. And the dog would eat the heart rate strap or it would fall off or it wouldn't work or I couldn't get the data and something would always happen with it. So I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, it's like, how else can we restrict them? Like to kind of get them down below max, but maybe make it harder. So I'm like, what if you only breathe in and out through your nose? And around that time, I read some Patrick McEwen stuff and I'm like, okay. So I tried it on myself and just on a rower, like I would max out at like, like 110, 112, you know, pretty darn low. And I was like, huh, my output was low, but it felt like my RPE felt really, really high. I was like, interesting. So I had some people uh, do it and they all reported back. So I had them do, okay, you're going to do a 5k on the rower. I don't care how hard you go. The caveat is you can only breathe in and out through your nose. You can't open your mouth. And pretty much everyone reported back like their max heart rate. Uh, one guy in particular was like 115. I'm like, how did it feel? He's like, I felt like I was drowning in air. <laughs> <laughs> like it felt really hard. But for that uh, audience, that was actually almost perfect because it felt really hard. So they were kind of into it because that's what they were used to. But it achieved my objective of trying to get them to do some lower intensity stuff. Mm. What I found was like for this guy in particular, you know, after about eight weeks of doing this two, three times a week, you know, his max was nasal in and out, like around 150 beats per minute, like relatively easy. Like for myself, I did a bunch of training on it and yeah, I can hit the high 150s nasal in and nasal out and be pretty good. So I think it is a good gauge to be sub max. How sub max it is, again, I think depends upon the person and their, their breathing efficiency and a bunch of other things and just practice too. You know, because you are almost on purpose to limiting air exchange to some degree, you're going to be building up more uh, CO2. We can argue if that's a benefit or a con. I think it just depends on what area of training you're at and what your training goals are. But I think for submax stuff, I do like it and it's useful. It will definitely limit you from all out max. I've seen um, some VO2 max tests where someone is trying to do nasal in, nasal out. And you'll see that they're just hypoventilating, right? They're just not getting enough air moved in and out under max. Um, where it really ends up, I haven't seen any hard data to say, is that really at your you know, anaerobic threshold? And there's even debate in the literature about you know, what that actually is. Are we looking at lactate? Are we looking at changes in air being exchanged? Are we looking at RER? Like what are, there's all these different inflection points we can look at. You know, RC is another one. So it's probably somewhere in there, but without an exact test, I think you'd be kind of hard pressed uh, to say exactly where it winds up. Mm. Yeah.